good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us in the world. Uh, welcome to our next uh, Nano Explorations, our, our twice weekly opportunity to engage with our students at MIT that are doing phenomenal research across nanoscience, nanoengineering, and technology and science broadly. I'll be your host for today, uh, Brian Anthony, the Associate Director at MIT Nano. Um, I will, my job is to introduce our, our gracious speaker for today and to shepherd questions at the end. Uh, we are being recorded, as you saw at the beginning. Uh, please, when we get to the end, raise your hand or uh, type your messages in chat, and I will marshal questions uh, to our speaker. Uh, so with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Melissa Notaros, who's a doctoral student in electrical engineering and computer science, uh, working in integrated photonics, but integrated photonics for enhanced reality. Her talk today, Liquid Crystal-Based Integrated Optical Phased Arrays, for augmented reality. Uh, with that, uh, Melissa, please uh, take it away. And, and participants, thank you for your time. And Melissa, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the introduction, Brian. Um, so as Brian mentioned, my name is Melissa Natarush. And today I'll be presenting on our work for liquid crystal-based integrated optical phase arrays for augmented reality. And we call this system Viper for short, which stands for Visible Integrated Photonics Enhanced Reality. So first I'll give an introduction to head-mounted displays in general, as well as some motivation behind our Viper head-mounted display, which is based on integrated optical phase rays. I'll then give a summary of the Viper All approach, overall Viper approach, and I'll go into some of the recent results that we've achieved. These results include transparent glass wafer bonding, passive holographic display, an integrated liquid crystal phase and amplitude modulator, and integrated the first integrated visible light liquid crystal based phased array, and an active Viper pixel, as well as scaling this pixel to a full display. So as most people are probably familiar, a head-mounted display is usually a pair of glasses or goggles that sit in front of the user's eye and relays information directly in the user's field of view. This means that the user can gain information from the glasses while also seeing their environment around them. There's many applications for head-mounted displays, just to name a few, are military, medicine, and engineering. Some of the current head-mounted displays, such as the Google Glass shown here, have a few limitations. Namely, they're large and heavy, so they're very indiscreet. Also, when you look through one of these devices, this is the type of image that you're going to see. So you can see that the field of view is actually very small, so the area where the information is relayed is very small. Also, as you can probably see from this image, the image quality is not very good. For example, it's not very bright, so I'm not sure where everyone is today, but here in Boston, it's a pretty, it's a pretty sunny day. So on a day like today, you wouldn't really be able to go outside and use these goggles outside. Also, another very important limitation of this type of display is that all of the information is displayed on one focal plane. And this focal plane is directly in front of the user's eye. So if someone is using this device, their eye is having to focus between this very close focal plane and then the farther away focal planes in their environment. So as your eye is focusing between these two focal planes, it causes eye fatigue. And this um, issue is known as the vergence accommodation conflict, and it can actually result in headaches for people, which limits how long people can use these devices. So with the Viper head-mounted display, we're aiming to solve all of these issues. The Viper head-mounted display is a chip that sits in front of the user's eye. It's a direct view near eye modality that projects fully holographic images for only the user to see. And because these images are fully holographic, this means that they have the appropriate depth cues, so it solves this virgin's accommodation conflict, and it allows for people to use this device for a long period of time. Also, the Viper display is flat and transparent, so it's highly discreet. The Viper head-mounted display is based on integrated optical phase rays. And a phase ray consists of an array of antennas across which a phase gradient is applied. 
that if you actively tune this phase gradient, you are able to steer the direction that the light is propagated. And with integrated optical phase arrays, you're able to place greater than 10,000 antennas on a millimeter scale chip. So integrated optical phase arrays allow for low cost and highly scalable wafer scale production. To date, there has been a lot of significant work on integrated optical phase arrays, and a majority of this work has been focused on this high speed beam steering. The driving application for these types of um, phased rays is mainly LIDAR for autonomous vehicles. There's also been integrated optical phased ray work for other modalities, such as far field patterns, um, focusing the beam in the near field to generate very focused spots, as well as generating interesting beam patterns, such as vessel beams. So we were interested in exploring if we're able to use integrated optical phased rays to generate 3D holograms. The Viper display consists of a grid of optical phase array pixels, and you can see one of these pixels shown here. The pixel consists of silicon nitride waveguides to route the light on the chip, liquid crystal modulators to actively tune the amplitude and phase of the light, and silicon nitride antennas to emit the light from the chip. And then the entire Viper display consists of a grid of these individual single pixels that are cascaded in both directions. And for this display, we encode each of these individual pixels to emit a hologram with the appropriate visual cues. So next I'll go into some of the exciting and recent results that we've achieved with this Viper system. So as you might imagine, if this chip is supposed to sit in front of a user's eye, it has to be transparent. You have to be able to see through the chip and see your environment around you. One of the first steps that we focused on in collaboration with our collaborators at CNSC SUNY was to develop a transparent silicon photonics platform. And here you can see a photograph of a fabricated transparent silicon photonics wafer. And we're holding it up in front of a window here, and you can very easily see through the wafer with very minimal distortion. And once you get this wafer, you can then dice it up into individual chips. And here you see a photograph of three chips inside a gel pack. And you can very nicely see the grid within this gel pack. It's, it's hardly even distorted. And also you can barely even see the chips that are in here. And this photograph on the right shows how the chip would eventually be used. The chip is placed in front of the user's eye and the user looks through the chip. And when you're looking through this chip, you can hardly tell that you're looking through anything at all. It's very, very transparent. Next, we wanted to, um, uh, to develop a passive holographic display. This passive display consists of a grid of over a thousand passive pixels and we route the light from a single silicon nitride waveguide to 32 silicon nitride waveguides via an MMI splitter tree. And then within this grid, in each row, we have a cascade of these individual passive pixels. And if we take a closer look at one of these individual passive pixels, you'll notice that there's three components that are varied from pixel to pixel. These three components are a phase taper, which encodes the absolute phase to each, each pixel, the evanescent tap that allows us to encode the amplitude of light that's coupled off into each pixel, and these cascaded taps that allow us to produce a phase gradient across the antennas. So for each pixel, we have these three components that we have to encode. Here you see a diagram of how this passive display is used. The Viper display would sit in front of the user's eye and then a virtual image is produced behind the Viper chip. And we use the gertzberg saxon algorithm to determine the encoding for each of the individual pixels. Here you can see a simulation result of the resulting image. Here we chose to focus on a wireframe cube that is projected one meter behind the Viper chip. And here you can see simulation results for these three components for each of the individual pixels. And again, that's the amplitude, absolute phase and phase gradient for each of the pixels. Next, we fabricated and experimentally demonstrated this passive display. Here you see a photograph of the experimental setup. We have the Viper chip 
and then sitting on top of the chip, we have a lens that emulates the lens in your eye, and then a camera that emulates the retina in your eye. And here you can see a photograph of the transparent passive projector. And here's an experimental result of the wireframe cube that is displayed one meter behind the Viper chip. So now with this passive display, we are able to display static images. So the next question we ask is what if we want to display videos? We would have to take this passive display and replace all those passive components with active modulators. Typically in silicon photonics, we use silicon as the waveguiding material because it's easy to modulate. However, silicon is lossy at visible wavelengths. So instead, as I mentioned earlier, we have to use silicon nitride. And this is because silicon nitride is transparent at visible wavelengths. However, silicon nitride has the downside that it's fairly difficult to modulate because it doesn't have significant electro-optic or thermo-optic properties. In order to address this challenge, we introduced liquid crystal. Liquid crystal has a strong barfringence between the two axes. We use pneumatic phase liquid crystal, which means that the liquid crystal molecules align in one dimension with respect to one another. This means that if you have a region that's filled with liquid crystal, the liquid crystal molecules will align in one direction. And this, and this initial alignment direction depends on some mechanical alignment layer, and this alignment layer actually mechanically anchors the molecules in a certain direction. Then if you apply an electric field across the liquid crystal region, the molecules will begin to rotate to align to this electric field. And then as you increase the strength of the electric field, eventually the molecules will completely align in the direction of the electric field. And then as you go the other way and reduce the strength of the electric field, the molecules will rotate back to their initial anchored position. And here you can see a cross section that demonstrates how we integrate the liquid crystal with the silicon photonics. Here you can see a mode simulation. This is our silicon nitride waveguide that's recessed within an oxide cladding down below. And then there's the liquid crystal region that sits on top of the waveguide. And here you can see a simulation of the mode within the waveguide. And you can see how the mode is actually pulled up slightly into the liquid crystal region. So this means that as we're modulating the index of the liquid crystal, we're also impacting the mode within the waveguide. And here you can see a more detailed cross-section of the device. We have our silicon nitride waveguide, which is recessed within the oxide cladding. And then we have a trench that is filled with liquid crystal that sits above the waveguide. We also have these integrated electrodes that sit on either side of the liquid crystal region. And we apply a voltage across these electrodes. Or in other words, we apply an electric field across the liquid crystal region. Initially, when we have zero voltage applied across the electrodes, the molecules are aligned parallel with the waveguide. And then as we um, apply a voltage across the electrodes and an electric field across the liquid crystal region, the molecules begin to rotate to align to that field until eventually we reach the maximum voltage where the molecules are completely aligned perpendicular to the waveguide. And as we're rotating these liquid crystal molecules, we are changing the refractive index of the liquid crystal, or in other words, we're changing the mode in this waveguide. So as we go through this length of liquid, of liquid crystal, we are inducing a phase shift. So now this device is fabricated on the wafer scale at CNSC SUNY, and the wafers are fabricated in a CMOS compatible 300 millimeter process. And once these wafers are fabricated, they're diced into chips. And then we do some further chip scale packaging in-house at MIT. On the top left here, you can see an initial cross section it consists of the silicon nitride that's recessed within the oxide. And then we have an empty trench above the waveguide. And the first step we do is a dry etch to bring the bottom of this trench closer to the top of the waveguide. And we want to do this because we want to get the liquid crystal as close to the waveguide as possible so that this mode in the waveguide can maximally interact with the liquid crystal. Then we pattern an SU8 resist spacer layer on top of the chip. And on top of this resist spacer layer, we place a glass chip. And this glass chip has an, a polyamide alignment layer on the bottom of it. And this is that um, alignment layer that mechanically anchors the molecules in their initial state. 
Now we formed a cavity and then we inject the liquid crystal into this formed cavity. And finally, we seal it off with UV cured epoxy. And here is a top view diagram of the final packaged chip. Again, we have our photonic chip with these photonic devices. This SU8 resist spacer layer is outlined around these devices. And we leave an input gap and two output gaps in this resist spacer layer. And then place this glass chip on top of the spacer layer and we seal it off with UV cured epoxy. And then we inject the liquid crystal through this input gap and the liquid crystal fills this entire region and finally we seal off these remaining gaps. And another important thing to note is that in blue here you can see these metal pads which sit outside of the liquid crystal region. And we touch down on these metal pads with electric probes. And that's how we apply that voltage to those integrated electrodes. So directly measuring phase is actually pretty difficult. So in order to characterize these devices, we integrate them into an integrated Moxender interferometer. This MCI has an input coupler that couples the light from a fiber onto the chip. Then we have a one by two multimode interferometer that splits into the two arms of the MCI. We have an LC phase shifter in both of the arms of the MZI. And finally, at the output, we have a two by one MMI and an output coupler to couple the light from the chip to a fiber, which then goes to a power meter. And we apply a 10 kilohertz square wave to one arm of the MZI. So we're modulating this top phase shifter. On the left here, you can see a photograph of the experimental setup. Here we have our final packaged chip. We have an input fiber and an output fiber that couple the light in and out of the chip. And here's that electric probe that I mentioned, which touches down on those metal pads that applies the voltage to the liquid crystal region. And when we modulate this top arm of the MCI, at the output, we're able to observe power modulation. So here you see experimental results of the output power. And when we're at a maximum power, this means that the two arms of the MCI are in phase. And when we're at our minimum power, that means that the two arms are out of phase. This means that when we dip down in power and then go back up, that corresponds to two pi phase shifts. So for this device, we are able to achieve 36 pi phase shifts in a 500 micron long device within only six volts peak to peak. This means that for your typical two pi phase shifter, you would only need 28 microns. This is a very significant result because in typical silicon nitride heater-based modulators, you would need hundreds of microns to achieve 2 pi. We then also explored how varying the waveguide width impacts the phase modulation. Here you see experimental results of as we increase the waveguide width, we are able to increase the amount of phase shift that we see, but it does take a larger amount of voltage to achieve that phase shift. We also explored how varying the width of the liquid crystal region impacts the phase modulation. <clears throat> and we were able to experimentally see that as we increase the width of the liquid crystal region, we're able to achieve the same amount of phase shift, but it takes more voltage to get there. And this makes sense because as you're increasing the width of the liquid crystal region, you're also increasing the distance between those integrated electrodes, so it simply takes more voltage to rotate the molecules. So with this device, we were able to show that we are able to achieve compact phase modulation. And we were also able to show that by integrating it into an MZI, we are able to achieve amplitude modulation. However, this MZI structure itself can get pretty long because as I mentioned before, the MZI has two MMIs, it has escalators, it has phase modulators in both of the arms. So overall, this MZI structure can get quite long. So we were interested in exploring if we're able to make a more compact amplitude modulator using this liquid crystal. The device we explored is a variable tap device. Here you can see a cross section and it's very similar to the phase modulator, except now we have a second tap waveguide that sits below the bus waveguide. And here you can see a top view of the device. We have this liquid crystal region with the bus waveguide that runs underneath the liquid crystal. And then we have this second tap waveguide that runs underneath the bus waveguide for a certain coupler length and then taps the light away. And the amount of light that is coupled into this tap waveguide depends on the coupling coefficient between these two waveguides. And this coupling coefficient between the two waveguides depends on the beta mismatch between the two 
as well as the mode overlap between the two waveguides. And what's very interesting here is that because the bus waveguide is directly below the liquid crystal, the mode in the bus waveguide is pretty significantly impacted by the liquid crystal as we're tuning it. However, because the tap waveguide is farther down, it doesn't really see this liquid crystal, so the mode in the tap waveguide stays fairly static. And here you can see a mode simulation of the mode in this top bus waveguide. At the low liquid crystal index, the mode is fairly well confined in the waveguide. And then as we increase the liquid crystal index, you can see that the mode is pulled up farther into the liquid crystal region. When designing this device, we have a few parameters that we have to work with. Namely, this is the bus waveguide width, the tap waveguide width, and this coupler length. So in designing this device, we first choose a bus waveguide width. And then for this given bus waveguide width, we choose the coupler length to ensure that there is no coupling at the high liquid crystal index. To do that, we do a simulation where we sweep the coupler length for a given tap waveguide width. And then for example, for a tap width of 390 nanometers, we would want a coupler length of 17 microns. And then we can repeat the simulation for various tap waveguide widths and calculate the appropriate coupler length for each tap width. And here you can see a wider sweep of tap waveguide width and the appropriate coupler length for each individual width. So the next choice we have to decide is which tap waveguide width do we use. And for that, we want to maximize the amplitude variation that we're able to achieve. So now for each tap waveguide width, we're sweeping the liquid crystal index. And for example, for this 390 nanometer wide waveguide, we're able to achieve from zero to 60 transmissions. And then again, we would repeat this for various tap waveguide widths. And then here we show the simulation results for a wide variety of tap waveguide widths. And then we would simply choose the tap waveguide width that gives us the most, most, the highest amount of variation. So for this device, a 300 nanometer, 390 nanometer wide tap waveguide gives us 60% trans, um, transmission variation. And again, this is only in a 17 micron long device. This is a very, very compact device. So next, we wanted to demonstrate the first integrated visible light liquid crystal phased array. For this system, we have one long liquid crystal region with a bus waveguide that runs underneath the liquid crystal. And then we have these cascaded evanescent taps that couple some of the light, that tap some of the light from this bus waveguide and route it to the antennas in the phased array. Here you can see a photograph of the experimental setup. On this card here, you can see the main lobe as well as some of the side lobes that are projected by the phased array. And here you see the experimental results of the far field. The main beam has a full width half max of 0.7 by 2.3 degrees. And then as we vary the voltage across that liquid crystal region, we're able to steer this beam. And as we increase the voltage, we're able to get 10.5 degrees of beam steering. So the next step we wanted to do was to take that passive Viper pixel that I mentioned earlier and generate this active pixel counterpart. So as I mentioned earlier, there are three main components that vary from pixel to pixel. In the passive display, these were static components, but now we want to replace each of these three components with its liquid crystal modulator counterpart. And this is what this active Viper pixel looks like. So now we have a liquid crystal phase shifter that is able to um, modulate the, ampli the, the absolute phase for each pixel. And then we have this liquid crystal variable task that is able to tune how much light is coupled into each pixel. And then we have this LC phase gradient that's allowed to, that's able to actively tune the phase gradient that goes across these antennas. So next, we fabricated and experimentally demonstrated one of these active pixels. And we showed a good performance in all three of these components. With our LC phase shifter, as we modulate the, as we vary the voltage across that device, we're able to achieve absolute phase shift for the pixels. For the variable tap, as we vary the voltage, we are able to modulate the amount of light that's coupled into the pixel. And then with our LC phase gradient, 
As we vary the voltage across that device, we're able to vary the phase gradient that's applied across these antennas. The next step is we wanted to, to take this active Viper pixel and then cascade it into a full display. And here you see one row in this Viper display. This row is made up of four individual pixels that are cascaded one after another. And a really important thing to note here is that the liquid crystal modulation and routing layers uh, happen in layers that are towards the top of the chip. And then in red here, you see the antennas, and these are in their individual silicon nitride um, layer, which is below the routing and modulation layers. And this is important because now we can take this row and duplicate it um, in the Y direction here. And now you can see that for the second row, the liquid crystal modulation and routing um, actually happens directly on top of the antennas of the first row. And this is very important because it allows us to make a very compact display. And here we just highlight the individual pixels just again to show how the pixels of the first display are really below the um, modulation of the second row. So next we fabricated and experimentally demonstrated this four by four array. And here you can see experimental results of us modulating the top row of the display. You can see that we're able to turn the individual pixels on and off um, independently. Then we took this four by four display and we turned on, specific, turned on and off specific pixels in the display in order to write out letters. So here we're showing the letter L and we change it to I, G, H, and T to finally spell out the word light. <clears throat> so we are able to demonstrate a four by four display, but looking towards the future, we would want to eventually have a display that has thousands of pixels. So how would we do that? We would do that by having a photonic chip that has thousands of these phased array pixels on it. And then we would have a TFT backplane chip and each of these TFTs individually addresses each of the pixels in the display. And then we would have this liquid crystal layer that is sandwiched in between the photonic chip and the electronic chip. And this work is currently ongoing. So just to summarize all of these recent displays that we've achieved, the Viper system, uh, through the Viper system, we proposed a phased array based holographic head mounted display. We're able to demonstrate a transparent glass wafer bonding. We also showed a passive holographic display that was used to um, project a wireframe cube. We also showed compact and low power integrated liquid crystal phase modulators and amplitude modulators. We showed the first integrated visible light liquid crystal based phase array. We've also shown our active single pixel as well as showing a display made by 16 of these pixels as well as um, working towards a solution for scaling this to thousands of pixels. So the current application for this Viper system is a head-mounted display for augmented reality. This Viper head-mounted display would solve a lot of the issues that I mentioned at the beginning. However, you can also imagine that this Viper system can be used for broader impacts. You can imagine this Viper display being used for TVs or other types of 3D displays. So this Viper system can really be applied uh, beyond just augmented reality. And most importantly, I would like to acknowledge all the work done by my coworkers at MIT. Um, a huge thanks to Yelena Natarush, as well as Manan Ravel and Michael Watts. I'd also like to thank the team at CNSC SUNY that fabricated the wafers. This team was led by Tom, Chris, and Dan. I'd also like to thank our funding sources, which consists of the DARPA Viper Program, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, and the MIT Presidential Fellowship. And at this point, I'd be very happy to take any questions. Melissa, thank you very much. I send you the, the virtual and the, the physical clapping <laughs> here. Uh, so participants, please uh, do raise your hands uh, or uh, enter a message into chat uh, to me or to everyone, and I'll, I'll marshal questions to Melissa. But let me just kick off um, with a question of my own. Um, as you think about the scale up and transition to sort of a, a real display or a real device, you know, there are issues such as, as power and, and, and resolution and refresh rate. 
of, of those, what do you think is the, the most important uh, research question or, or, or scale up question that needs to be addressed to actually start to translate such technology into a device of some sort? Yeah, so the, the biggest sort of issue with scaling it up is just how do you address these thousands of pixels? Uh, for example, for the 4x4 display, we were able to just route the electrodes through the display. But when you have thousands of pixels, you just don't have physical space to do that. So the biggest concern with scaling is just how do you address these pixels? And as I mentioned in that one slide, um, we'd hope to address that with that TFT backplane. Um, and then the TFT backplane itself um, is very high speed, so the speed issues don't come with that. Um, if you're trying to make it um, higher speed, the, the limitation would more be on the photonic side uh, with, the, with the liquid crystal switching. Very good, uh, thank you. So let me go to some of the questions uh, in the chat here. Um, one of the questions, um, how does the holographic projection compare to projection onto the retina of the eye uh, and like what uh, Avgon's uh, technology is as a company that's making a, a head mounted display. Mm -hmm. So this display actually does project the light straight into your into your retina. So the way the holographic display works is the chip is sitting in front of your eye and it's projecting into your eye. And then the way the um, wave fronts are, it, it looks as if an image is coming from behind the display. So the image is not actually being projected out into the world. Very good, thank you. Um, another question here uh, was related to a particular application space. Um, how does this technology uh, for pilots make flights or flight simulations more efficient or easier to process information? So more on the consumer side of, of, uh, of a head-mounted virtual display. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess just head-mounted displays in general. Um, so that's, that's one way of uh, sending information to the user. Um, another way would be like heads up displays, um, and that would be where, for example, in the flight um, uh, application, the information would be displayed perhaps somewhere in the cockpit of the, the plane. There's also head down displays where the information would be displayed um, perhaps somewhere around the, um, the controls for the plane. Um, so in both of those cases, the user has to avert their gaze in order to get this information. So with the head mounted display, it's just nice because it, it directly is in your field of view. So you can be looking at your environment and just quickly gaining this information. Very good, thank you. Uh, another question uh, in comparison to existing products, uh, what would the view look like through your uh, liquid crystal display compared to Google Glasses now? Um, so it's, um, it would look fairly similar. So our chip, as I mentioned earlier, is, is extremely transparent. That's one of that was one of our main goals. So um, ideally, when you're looking through this chip, you wouldn't see any type of blurring or distortion. And then as far as the image that you see, um, as I mentioned, this chip is directly, um, you know, directly projecting light into your eye. So you would then see an image, um, and because it's this holographic. Uh, modality, the image will actually be displayed as if it's coming from the environment around you. So it's as if you have a, say, a cube sitting in front of you and it's, it's directing these wave fronts towards your eye. And that really helps solve this virgence accommodation conflict that I mentioned earlier, because now you can have different images being projected as if they're from these different wave, uh, wave um, uh, focal planes, sorry. So now if you have, say, someone sitting in front of you a meter away, you can place a, a so-called name tag that only you would see that would remind you of their name. And then you could have someone standing two meters behind them. And again, you could, you could have like a little name tag on that person. So you can really have these, these images as if they're coming from different focal points in different places in the environment around you. Very good, thank you. Um, another question here sent to me uh, directly. Um, Maybe you can comment on the, I think the brightness, um, you know, how would the, this approach potentially solve the dimness issue with competitive approaches? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we haven't directly characterized the brightness yet. <clears throat> However, with this device, um, the liquid crystal itself does not introduce um, significant loss. So really the only loss would just be the intrinsic loss in the waveguide. So really most of the power uh, would be projected out of the chip into the image. So you're able to achieve bright images. Um, thank you. Another question. Um, maybe they, the comment, maybe they missed it, but how do you plan to scale up the liquid crystal integration into a large scale fabrication process? Um, so on this slide, as I mentioned, we have a photonic chip that has these pixels on it, and then this TFT backplane chip that has these uh, the electronics on it, and the liquid crystal layer would be in between these two chips. And currently, the we do the liquid crystal packaging, you know, on the chip scale at MIT, and that's just because we're sort of developing the process. Um, but we're actually working um, in collaboration with Copen on this. And they already have developed a process where you can actually do more large scale liquid crystal packaging um, and they do it um, in an automatic process. So you can really then start doing it on the wafer scale. Very good. Uh, thank you. So I, I think with, with that, we're at probably at a, a very good time to, again, uh, Melissa, thank you very much uh, for both the very interesting work uh, and the, the phenomenal presentation. Uh, and participants, thank you for your time. Uh, so I send you the physical and in, in, in the virtual clap again. And I do want to remind everybody, um, so we are our twice uh, weekly engagement with the uh, MIT student community. And on Tuesday, July 14th at 11 a.m., our, our next speaker will be Ali uh, Kalatapur speaking about new frontiers in terahertz quantum cascade lasers. Uh, so with that, uh, Melissa, again, thank you very much. Participants, thank you. Everybody stay safe and have a good remainder of your day. So thank you. Thank you.